Amen. Well, good evening. Good evening. If you've got your Bibles there, uh, please go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. And as you're turning there, I'd like to take you back to 1990, all right? I'm not going to sing, I'm not going to dance, but we are going to go back to 1990. And in 1990, I was 16 years old and just got my driver's license. And when you're 16 years old and you just get your driver's license, the next thing you want is a car, right? So I wanted a car, but I didn't want any car. I didn't want like a, a, a junky car, you know? I wanted, a, I wanted a cool car. I wanted a car that had some power. That's what I wanted. I wanted a car that had some power. And so if you're 16 years old and it's 1990 and you don't have a lot of money, here's the car that you're probably going to go after. I wanted a five liter Mustang. Okay? That's what I wanted. I wanted a five liter Mustang. And so uh, I talked to my parents about that and they did not want me to have a five liter Mustang. A good call, parents. Good call. That would have been a huge mistake for me to get a five liter Mustang when I was 16 years old. So here's what I got instead. Ready? I got a 2.3 liter Mustang. Four cylinder, 2.3 liter Mustang. And uh, if you know anything about cars, then you know that a five liter, 2.3 liter look kind of similar, but under the hood, they are totally different. Okay, totally different. One has a ton of power and one has no power at all. And so I would, I would you know, kind of drive around places and, and people would see my car and they'd be like, hey, nice car, nice car. Is that a five liter? I'd be like, no, it is not a five liter. It is a 2.3 liter. And I just, I just longed, you know, to, to be able to kind of step down on, on the accelerator and to feel some power. And, and I just knew that wasn't going to happen, you know, and I just, but I just longed for power. And I, and I think that for many of us, our Christian lives kind of feel like that. We're just, we're just longing for, for power. We just feel like we're lacking power. And we hear the great commandment to, to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we say, yes, I want that. And we hear the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And we're like, yes, I want that. We see the new discipleship model of our church, the 5G life up on the screen. We say, yes, I want this. I, I want to be a Christ follower who's abiding in Christ and connecting with other believers and, and sharing the love of Christ. I want to have God time every day. That's amazing. I want to have a gather time. I want to get together with the church. I want to be a source of encouragement. I want, I want to have group time. I want to be connected with, with the body and doing uh, life with others. I want give time. I want to be stewarding the gifts that God has given to me. I want, I want go time. I want to live life on mission. I'm going to do it. And then we go to do it and we lack power. And if we're lacking power, here's the problem. It's abiding. It's abiding because that's where the power flows to live the Christian life. And so the Lord has a two things for us to see today. Here's the first one. Firstly, that in and of ourselves, we have absolutely no power to live the Christian life. None at all. We have no power in and of ourselves uh, to live the Christian life. When we hit the gas and there's no power, that's because we have no power. It's not like we have a 2.3 liter engine. We don't even have an engine, okay? We have no power in and of ourselves, but there's also this, secondly, that the immeasurable power of God to live the Christian life is available to every single child of God here today. Let me repeat that. The immeasurable power of God to live the Christian life is available to every single child of God here today. And God not only wants us to know about this power, but he wants us to actually experience his immeasurable power. And so what if... 2017 was a year for us, a year for you and me, where we experienced the power of God in our lives like never before. What if we were to look back on 2017 and say, and say, you know what, that was the year, that was the year where things really changed for me because that was the year where I really started to experience the power of God like never before. Because listen, that can be you and that can be me this year. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is praying for in Ephesians chapter 3. He's praying that the Ephesians would experience the immeasurable power of God in their lives, which is exactly what we need to experience as well. 
And so today we're going to look at the first half of Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. And then Lord willing, Lord willing, next week, Pastor Craig is going to lead us through the second half of this amazing prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. So please have a look with me at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Ephesians 3, verse 14. Paul says this. He says, For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that leads us right into our first point this uh, this, this evening, which is this. If you and I are going to experience the immeasurable power of God in our lives in 2017, we must first know this. We must know the means of power is prayer. The means of power is prayer. Have a look at verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. So in other words, Paul's saying, for this reason, Ephesians, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, Ephesians, for this reason. And so what reason is Paul referring to here? Well, here's the reason. It's the gospel. It's it's these great, glorious gospel truths that Paul has just stated all throughout chapters 1 and 2. And so maybe you're thinking, well, what great, glorious gospel truths are these? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here are uh, some up on the screen right here. Uh, Look at this one. God blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. Awesome. God, God predestined us for adoption. He redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's given us an inheritance. He purposed for us to hope in Christ so we might be to the praise of his glory forever and ever. He sealed us with his promised Holy Spirit. He loved us even when we were dead in our sin. He made us alive together with Christ. He saved us through faith. He created us in Christ Jesus for good works. And he has united us now into one people for him, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And so Paul says, for this reason, for this reason, because of the gospel, because of these great, glorious, awesome gospel truths, he says, Ephesians, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, Ephesians. And we're going to see why he's praying and what he's praying for in a few minutes. But notice next, notice next, notice Paul's posture of prayer. Look back at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Paul says this, for this reason, I bow my knees. Now to understand the significance of Paul bowing, kneeling before God, we need to understand that kneeling was a pretty unusual posture of prayer in Paul's day. Most Jews would pray standing up. So the fact that Paul is kneeling, he's bowing down, it it says something, it's communicating something. And most uh, commentators agree that what this is communicating is Paul's great passion for what he's praying right now. Paul is so passionate about what he's praying right now for the church. Question, when was the last time that you were so burdened that you just wanted God to move so powerfully in someone's life that you just fell to your knees right there and prayed for them? Because this is what Paul is doing. He's falling to his knees with passionate prayer. And notice this, notice who Paul is praying to. Notice who he's praying to, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So Paul is praying to the Father through whom, through Jesus Christ, has adopted Paul who through Jesus Christ has adopted these Ephesians as his very own children, and he has given them a name, and he loves each one of them more than they can ever possibly imagine. And if you are here this evening, and you are a child of God, know this, you are not some number to God the Father. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He chose you. And he adopted you. 
and he named you and he delights in you and he rejoices over you and he will never take his eyes off you and he will never leave you or forsake you because he loves you more than anyone else ever has, ever could or ever will. He is God the Father. He is God, your perfect Father. And because Paul knows the Father, and because he spends time with the Father, and because he loves the Father, here's what Paul does. He does the will of the Father. He does what the Father wants him to do, and he prays for the church because the church in Ephesus was in great need of prayer, because the church in Ephesus was in great need of power. And it's certainly no different for the church in our day. The church right here in Oakville, the church in Ontario, the church in Canada, the church around the world is in great need of prayer because the church is in great need of power and prayer is the means of laying hold of the power of God. Prayer is the means of power. So question, are you praying for the church? Are you praying for the church? Because God wants to use your prayers to strengthen and empower and encourage the church both right here and around the world. And that's why we must pray. We must pray for ourselves. We must pray for our families. We must pray for this room. We must pray for our church. We need to pray for, for our staff. We need to pray for our elders. We need to pray for our church plants. We need to pray for the church in Ontario and in Canada and around the world because for the church to thrive, the church needs, needs, needs the power of God. And prayer is the means of power. Therefore, we must pray. We must pray. And as we pray, we must do this. We must recognize the source of power the Holy Spirit. And that's our second point. We must recognize the source of power of the Holy Spirit. If we're going to be strengthened with power in 2017, we must recognize the source of all power, the Holy Spirit. Have a look back at verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So now we're starting to move into more of the content of Paul's prayer. Have a look at verse 16. Verse 16, Paul prays. He says, according, according to the riches of his glory. And we'll stop there because that word according is very important. If a a wealthy person, a, a billionaire, was to give someone in need $50. That would be a kind gesture. That person would be a giving out of their wealth. They would be giving from their wealth, but they would not be giving according to their wealth because they would not be giving in a way that's representative of their wealth. But if that same person was to, to purchase a house for, for that needy person, or if that, that wealthy person was to purchase a hospital, then, then yes, they'd be giving, they would be giving out of their wealth, they would be giving from their wealth, but they would also be giving according to their wealth because they would be giving in a way that is in keeping with their wealth or in a way that is in line with their wealth or, or is representative of their wealth. Now, keeping that in mind, let's consider again what Paul is praying for here in verse 16. Have a look again at verse 16. He says that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power. So Paul is praying that that God would give the Ephesians power, but not just power from his riches, not just power out of his riches, but power, listen, according to his riches and glory. In other words, Paul is praying that God the Father would give the Ephesians power that is according to or in keeping with the riches of his power. And so how much power is that? Well, consider Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. 
all things were created through him and for him. Or consider Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. So how much power does our God have? His power is limitless. His power is inexhaustible. His power is above and beyond all scales of measurement. Therefore, for Paul to ask God to give the Ephesians a degree of power that is according to his riches in glory is asking God to give the Ephesians an immeasurable amount of spiritual power through the source of power who is the Holy Spirit. Again, verse 16. That according, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So this is what Paul is praying for up on the screen. He's praying for their hearts. He's praying for the hearts of the Ephesians, that something would take place in their hearts. And, and that's where the Holy Spirit dwells. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in their hearts. And so here's what he's praying for. He's praying that the Holy Spirit would flood their hearts with immeasurable power. This is what he's praying for. And so question do you realize the magnitude of the power that is available to you through the Holy Spirit? Can you, can you grasp the reality that the one who is all powerful, the one who has all power is living inside of you? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit that kills sin? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit that brings about obedience to the great commandment? The power of the Holy Spirit that brings about obedience to the great commission? The power of the Holy Spirit that brings about the 5G life? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit? Because if we're not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, the problem isn't the Holy Spirit. Point to where the problem is. The problem's with us. And so what might the problem be? Well, let's begin with this. Do we really believe that the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit is available to us? I mean, do we really believe that? Do you really believe that? Do I really believe that? Well, how do I know? Well, here's how I know if we really believe it. If we really believe it, we'll be praying for it. If we really believe that this power is available to us, we will be praying for it. In Luke 11, Jesus said, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So am I, am I doing that? Am I praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill my heart because the means of power is prayer, but the source, the source of power is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we must pray. We must pray for the power of the Holy Spirit if, if we want our hearts flooded with his immeasurable power. That leads us right into our third point, uh, which is this. If we want to be strengthened with power in 2017, we must want the result of power, a heart change. If we uh, want to be strengthened with power in 2017, we must want the result of power, which is this, heart change. Have a look back at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that, here's the reason, here's the reason, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. So again, Paul is praying. This is what he's doing. He's praying, which is the means of power. And he's praying that God the Father would strengthen the church through the source of power, who is the Holy Spirit, so that, here's the result of power, so that Christ would dwell in 
their hearts, which seems to be kind of a strange thing for Paul to be praying for, doesn't it? That the result of this immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit, the result of it, the end of it, would be Christ dwelling in their hearts? I mean, isn't he praying for the church? Don't they already have Christ dwelling in their hearts? Well, here's what we need to see. Paul is not praying for the initial indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul is not praying that God the Father would send the Holy Spirit to indwell these believers for the first time. They're the church. They, they already have the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand what that word dwell means. What does the word dwell mean here? Well, here's what it means. That word dwell is a compound word in the Greek that, that means two things. The first, the first word means uh, to live in a house. And then the second word means down. So that, that word dwell means to live in a house, and it means down. So this word dwell here means, it means to settle down in a house. It means to make a comfortable home inside a house. And so when Paul is praying that, that the Father would strengthen the church through the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit, this is ultimately the result that he's praying for, that Christ would dwell in the hearts of the Ephesians, that Christ would be comfortable, that Christ would be at home in their hearts. Now, when my wife, Natasha, and I bought our first home, it was in rough shape, okay, just to say the least, but the price was right. The price was right, and so we got it. And so our first home was a 50-year-old bungalow, uh, and literally nothing had been done to it in 50 years, and I mean that. Not a single thing had been done to it in 50 years, and uh, there's two people that we, we bought it from, the original owners, and they were both very, very heavy smokers, all right? And so when I walked into that house for the first time, I literally felt like I was standing in an ashtray. Like, that's what I felt like. It was like, man, like, if, if we're going to live in this house, it's going to take a lot of work before we feel comfortable living here, you know? And so let me give you an idea up on the screen of what we were dealing with, all right? So um, I don't know who that guy is. Don't, don't pay any attention to him. Don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. Okay, so, so you'll notice the wall in the background. Okay, you see the wall in the background? Looks like there is a, a, a shelf, a shelving system there with a bunch of plates. Do you see that? There's no shelving system and there's no plates. Okay, the contrast you see there is tar. That's tar. So you have an idea of what we were up against. And so we were washing walls and, and, and painting walls and ceilings and we were ripping up 50-year-old carpet and we were scrubbing down floors and doing work in a basement, in a bathroom and in a kitchen. And, and it took a long time. We lived there a while before we could finally sit down on the couch and say, hey, you know what? This is kind of starting to feel like home. This is kind of feeling like home, you know? And that's what Christ wants to say about us. That we are starting to feel like home. Now, praise the Lord that Christ does not wait for us to be the perfect home before he first inhabits us. Amen? Uh, Christ is present in the heart of every believer, but he does not dwell comfortably in the heart of every believer. Christ is present in the heart of every believer, but he does not dwell comfortably in the heart that is given over to sin. He may be present there, but he's not at home there. He does not dwell there. But here's where he does dwell. And you can jot this down. Here's where he does dwell. Christ dwells in the heart where he is worshiped as Lord. Christ dwells comfortably in the heart where he is worshiped as Lord. 1 Peter 3.15 says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. 1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy because Christ only dwells comfortably in the heart where he is worshiped as Lord, in the heart that is in awe of him, in the heart that is filled with love for him in the heart that is surrendered to him, 
in the heart where, where there's a throne and, and it has his name on it and it's vacant waiting for him to come and, and take his rightful place. That's the heart where he dwells. And a heart like that is not created from our effort. A heart like that, a heart that is a suitable dwelling place for Christ comes about only through the awesome, immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit who comes in and renovates the heart and makes it into a place where Christ is worshiped as Lord. Again, have a look at verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. So this is what Paul is praying for up on the screen. He's praying for their hearts. And we can think of it this way, that in our hearts, there are basically three giant rooms. There are three giant rooms in our hearts. There's the room of the mind. And then there's the room of the affections. And then there's the room of the will. There's three giant rooms in your heart and in my heart. And so here's what Paul is praying for, that the Holy Spirit who dwells in the heart would, would flood the heart with his immeasurable power and that this immeasurable power would renovate the heart, would change the heart, every room in the heart, so that in the mind, Christ would be Lord. And in the affections, Christ would be Lord. And in the will, Christ would be Lord, because this is the heart that he dwells in comfortably. More and more and more and more. And the more comfortably he dwells in us, the sweeter our fellowship with him will be. The more comfortably he dwells in us, the sweeter our fellowship with him will be. It kind of reminds me of what Jesus Christ had to say to the church in Laodicea. Remember the lukewarm church? In Laodicea, this is what he said. He said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And we read that verse and, and sometimes we have this idea of Jesus being this sort of weak savior who's kind of wandering around, knocking on doors, hoping that someone's gonna open the door and let him in so he can have a meal. And that could not be further from the truth. That is so wrong because Jesus Christ is not some visitor. He is the Lord God Almighty who owns the house. He owns the house. He comes to the door as the owner of the house. He comes to the door as Lord of the house. He comes to dwell in that which is rightfully his. We are not the owners of this house. He is. We are stewards. Our hearts are not our own. They belong to him. And when the immeasurable power of the Holy Spirit is moving in our hearts and our hearts are changed and our mind is changed, our affections are changed, our will is changed, that's when we open the door and we worship him as the Lord of the house. And that's the heart in which he chooses to dwell. So let me ask you, let me ask you, to what degree are you worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord in your heart? To what degree am I worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord in my heart? Let's consider our minds. Are we thinking the thoughts that he wants us to think? Are we, are we putting into our minds what he wants us to put into our minds? Is, is your thinking in line with his word? Are you thinking big thoughts about who God is? Are you thinking great, glorious gospel truths? Are you thinking about his magnificent, wonderful promises? Is he the Lord of your mind? Or consider, consider your affections. Are we, are we loving what he wants us to love? Are we loving God? Are we, are we loving people? Are we loving holiness? Is he the Lord of our affections? Or consider, consider our will. 
Are we doing what he's commanded us to do? Are we, are we loving our neighbor? Are we seeking to make disciples? Are we seeking to live for his glory? Is he the Lord of our will? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, at least for me, at least for me, here's what we see. That Christ is not being worshipped as Lord of our hearts as he should be. And because of that, Christ is not dwelling in our hearts as he wants to be. And our fellowship with him, therefore, is not as sweet as it could be. And so what do we do? Do we just try harder to worship him? Well, praise the Lord, that's not the answer, okay? We can't somehow will ourselves to worship Christ in our hearts. It doesn't work like that. There's no power found in trying harder. Hear that. There is no power found in trying harder. So where is real power found? Well, consider the path that we've walked so far. Let's retrace our steps. Here's the path. Power, real power, spiritual power is found through the means of power, which is prayer. Prayer. Through the source of power, who is the Holy Spirit, so that we experience the result of power, which is heart change and Christ dwelling in our hearts. And so the answer is not trying harder. The answer is the Holy Spirit bringing about heart change in us through prayer. That's the answer, which leads us to a very, very, very important question that we have yet to address this evening, which is this. By what channel, by what channel does the power of the Holy Spirit flow to us? Uh, Because if we want to experience the immeasurable power of God in our lives in 2017 so that Christ dwells in our our hearts, we need to recognize the channel of power. We need to recognize the channel of power, which is this, faith. The channel of power is faith. And this is a point number four. We must recognize the channel of power, which is faith. It's faith. Verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Notice this, through faith, through faith. So again, here's what the apostle Paul is praying for, that through the means of power, which is prayer, The Father would give the church power through the source of power, who is the Holy Spirit, so that the church would experience the result of power, which is heart change, so that Christ would dwell in their heart. But here's what we need to see, that all of this power flows to us from the Holy Spirit through a channel, and that channel is faith. It's faith. And so what is faith? Well, here's, here's what faith is. A faith is what Paul prayed for in Ephesians chapter one. Listen to what Paul prayed for. Ephesians chapter one, verse 19, I'll read it to you. He prayed this, that they would know, that they would know, the Ephesians would know in experience, they would know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward those who believe. That's faith, that's faith power that comes through believing, the immeasurable greatness of the power of God toward those who believe. So faith is believing the word of God. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith is believing God, taking God at his word when he tells us in his word who he is. And when he tells us what he has done, and when he tells us uh, what he has promised. Faith is the channel of power because the power of the Holy Spirit flows to us through faith. We can think of it this way. If you need to get engine oil into the engine of a car, you wouldn't just kind of open the hood, take the engine oil and dump it all over the top of the engine, right? You wouldn't do that. Uh, Don't do that. That would be a bad plan. That's a recipe for smoke. We don't want that, okay? You need a channel in order to get that oil into the motor. So you need to take off the top and get the channel, which is a funnel. You need to put the funnel there. You pour the oil into the funnel. That's the channel that gets the oil into the motor where it needs to be. Likewise, that's what faith is. 
Faith is the channel uh, that the Holy Spirit uses to infuse power, to get power, to, to flood our hearts with power for heart change. We can think of it this way up on the screen. That as we truly believe who God is, and as we truly believe what God has done, great, glorious gospel truths, and as we truly believe what God has promised, and we think about it, and we dwell on it, and we meditate on it, and we believe it, that is the channel for the power of God to transform our hearts and transform our lives. And this is ultimately what Paul is praying for. Paul says, for this reason... So because of all these great, glorious gospel truths, for this reason, I'm praying for you, Ephesians, that the power of the Holy Spirit would flood your heart and transform your heart so that Christ would dwell in you through faith, through not just hearing of these glorious gospel truths, but actually believing them, actually believing them and then being transformed. And that's Paul's prayer. So let me ask you, let me ask you, what have you been believing lately about God? What have you been believing lately about God? Or what have you been believing lately about what God has done for you? If an unbeliever came up to you and said to you, hey, so you're a Christian, right? And, and so, so you believe the Bible? Hey, maybe you could give me a couple of verses about who God is and what God has done. Would you have some verses that you could give to them? Because those verses have been, have been in your heart, in your mind, you've been thinking through them, so it's, it's easy to give them. Have you been thinking much about the promises of God? What if somebody came up to you even here tonight and said, hey brother, hey sister, I'm just, I'm so discouraged. Do you, do you have a promise for me from the word of God that would encourage me? Would you, would you be able to give them a promise because that promise has been on your heart and, and God's been using that in your life? And as we consider those questions, could it be, could it be that so often our lack, yours and mine, our lack of spiritual power is the result of filling our hearts and minds with so many other things, good things. Filling our hearts and minds with so many things at the expense of filling our hearts and minds with the reality of God's word and the reality of who God is and what he has done and what he has promised. Because here's what God wants to do in us. Here's what God wants to do in you. Here's what he wants to do in me. He wants to pour out his power into our lives through the channel of power, which is faith. This is what God wants to do. The Holy Spirit in us through the means of faith, through the channel of faith, he wants to pour out his power into our hearts so that he becomes the Lord of, of our mind and he is the Lord of our affections and he is the Lord of our will so that our hearts are a place where he dwells comfortably, more and more and more. This is what God wants to do in us. And faith, faith is the channel of God's power in our lives for a heart transformation. Therefore, therefore, if we want to be strengthened with power in 2017, we need to open up the channel of power, which is faith. If we want to be strengthened with power, we need to open up the channel of power, which is faith. So how important then is it that we make 2017 a year where we, we open up the channel of, of power by delighting in and meditating upon and thinking about and believing the word of God? Because if there's no word, then there's no faith. If there's no faith, then there's no channel of power. If there's no channel of power, there's no heart change. If there's no heart change, there is no Christ dwelling in our hearts. So how important is it then that in 2017, we are a people that are opening up the channel of power by reading and delighting in and meditating upon and thinking about the word of God? But what if we also had this? What if each one of us also had this? What if we had a couple of verses that we were to grab hold of and carry around in our hearts all year long? What if we had maybe even three verses, a verse about who God is, a verse about what God has done, and, and a promise from God that we were to put in our hearts and carry around with us? What if we had a couple of verses like this? Now, what if we had a verse about who God is? And the whole Bible is about who God is. But what if we had a, a verse like this, Revelation 21, 23? 
and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. This is a picture of the heavenly Jerusalem with Jesus Christ shining in all his glory and full strength. This is your inheritance. This is right around the corner. What if you had this verse, I had this verse in my heart, and we chose to think about it and open up the channel of power in our lives for the Spirit to work? Or what if we had a verse about, about what God has done? And again, the Bible is a story of redemption. So many verses we could choose from. What if we had a, a gospel verse like this? That 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. What if we took that verse and, and put it in our heart and, and took time, we're driving in the car, we're, we're, we're meditating on this verse, we're just thinking, Wow. God loved me so much that he came to earth and he lived the perfect life I could never live. And then he gave himself over to the cross. He took all of my sin upon him. The wrath of God fell upon him. He died in my place and he justified me, not just so that he could justify me, but that he could bring me to see him in all his glory up here. Awesome. What would happen in our lives if we, if we had a verse about what God has done and we thought about it and we opened up the channel of power for the spirit to be working in our hearts? Or what if we had also a promise about uh, a promise from God? And again, the Bible is a book of promises. But what if you had a promise like this? Isaiah 41:10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What if we put that in our hearts this year? We we did life, and everywhere we went, we had to remember: I don't need to be afraid today. I don't need to be afraid because God is with me and he's going to help me and he's going to strengthen me and he's going to hold me up with his righteous right hand. What would, what would happen in our hearts if we opened up the channel of power and let the spirit work as we believed verses like this, a verse about who God is, a verse about what God has done, a verse that is a promise from God. Here's what would happen. As we begin to meditate on who God is, that the spirit of God would work in our hearts to produce awe of God awe of God. As we, as we begin to meditate on what God has done and gospel truths, here's what the Spirit does in us. He produces in our hearts love for God. And as we, as we begin to meditate on a promise of God where he says he's going to help us and strengthen us and take care of us, here's what the Spirit does in us. He begins to produce in us peace, the peace of God. So then we have a heart that is filled with awe of God and love for God and the peace of God. And that is a heart, loved ones, that worships Christ as Lord. And that is a heart where Christ is pleased to dwell. And that is what Paul is praying for in the first half of this prayer in Ephesians chapter three, that through the means of power, which is prayer, the Father would give the church power through the source of power, who is the Holy Spirit, so that the church would experience the result of power, which is heart change, and Christ dwelling in their hearts through the channel of power, which is Faith, faith, oh Lord, let that be what happens in our hearts this year, 2017. Would you pray with me? Let's pray, let's pray. So Father, thank you so much that we get to open up your word tonight and we get to read this incredible prayer of the Apostle Paul. And God, this is what we're praying for as well. God, we need your power. We are desperate for your power. We need your power to be working in our hearts and, and renovating them and changing our mind and changing our affections and, and changing our will. And God, you've told us that the, the path of power, the, the channel of power is faith. And so God, would you please, we pray, would you please be working in us this year? Help us to see the importance of your word. Help us to see, God, that, that we need to, to read your word. We need to study your word. We need to meditate upon your word. We need to believe your word. And God, as we open up that channel, Lord, would you please work in us that we, we would see an increase in our faith, that we would see an increase in, in the activity of the Spirit of God working in our hearts and transforming us and producing the fruit of the Spirit. God, we want this to be a year where we are truly living out the 5G life. God, we know we can't do it. We need you. So that's what we're praying for, God. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.